Thank you all. Uh, thanks for quieting right down and uh, for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Mike Skelton. I'm the CEO of the Greater Manchester Chamber. I'm going to be uh, helping to uh, moderate this uh, meeting this evening. I want to thank you all again for for being here and engaging in this uh, important uh, conversation on, on homelessness in Manchester. Um, tonight's meeting is in response to interest we've heard in the community and to provide an update on uh, many of the efforts and work going on throughout the community from a number of different stakeholders and organizations to address this issue. Um, we have a number of uh, officials and, and partners in the room who are available to answer questions and a big part of tonight is to hear directly from all of you. So um, after we get through some introductions and, and uh, welcoming remarks, um, we have some folks here who are really experts uh, working on uh, homelessness in our community who can answer questions and, and listen to feedback. And um, really our goal for this evening is to not only provide you with an update on things that are happening, but um, provide you that opportunity to ask questions. And I think if there's one thing uh, we've learned about uh, this issue and, and uh, how to make progress is that it requires a, a conversation within our community and, and collaboration and communication. So I appreciate everyone taking the time to be here tonight to participate uh, in that effort. Just a couple of kind of housekeeping things real quickly. There were sign-in sheets on your way in. If you didn't sign in, I'd ask if you would, just so we want to be able to communicate with all of you after this meeting. Uh, so there'll be plenty of sign-up sheets out back or out front on your way out uh, that you could sign in for. Um, we have several partner organizations and entities that brought material and handouts and information that's going to be available in that same area. So please help yourself. Uh, there is just so much information to consume as part of this effort. So uh, we wanted to provide this session and future sessions as an opportunity to connect you with that information that's out there. Um, uh, I'm gonna, in a moment, I'm going to ask uh, Mayor Craig to, uh, to welcome us and give us a few remarks. I'd also just like to make a few introductions of some other uh, partners in the room. I'm going to introduce our panel in a moment, um, but I'd like to uh, recognize there are several aldermen joining us this evening. Alderman Tim Baines, Bill Barry, and Dan O'Neill. Thanks for being here tonight, Alderman. Uh, also, uh, Police Chief uh, Carl Capano is here, and Emily, uh, Emily Rice, our city solicitor, are here and are available to answer questions during the discussion uh, that may come up this evening. So uh, I know there's other folks in the room who have participated in the task force or um, other aspects of this issue. And again, we welcome your, your participation. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome Mayor Craig up to say a few words. Mayor Craig. Thank you, Mike, and good evening, everyone. Um, I really want to thank you all for being here. You know, homelessness is a complex issue and something that um, is not going to be able to be addressed overnight. And as Mike said, many people for years have been working on this issue and have made great progress, uh, but we need to continue working on this and focusing on it. And so I want to thank everyone for the work that's been done to date. Um, there are a number of contributing issues that cause someone to be homeless. Uh, they include extreme poverty, mental health issues, uh, substance use disorder, and affordable housing or lack of affordable housing, um, all of which we're seeing in our city. And um, as Mike said, you know, ending homelessness is a community effort. And I'm so grateful for all of you being here and for those of you who have participated in this over the last several months. Um, the solution certainly won't happen overnight, but I'm confident with the commitment that we have here and in this committee, in this community, um, that we will be able to come up with a solution. So I did want to take a few minutes just to talk a little bit about what we have accomplished. Um, so uh, for one thing, the city has partnered, uh, thanks in, in large part to the commitment by the Board of Mayor and Aldermen to funding New Horizons uh, Fit Shelter. Um, so we are addressing and helping with them redoing and renovating their facilities so individuals feel comfortable and want to be there. The city has also uh, approved funding uh, to keep New Horizons Fit Shelter open during the day. It's something that hadn't happened before, but today the shelter is open during the day, so anyone who needs help during the day can go there. And with it being open during the day, there are also resources there so someone can get help if they're facing substance use disorder or any other issues. 
The city has also opened ADA compliant porta toilets in Veterans Park, something that we didn't have prior to. We have increased significantly the police presence in downtown more than any other time in the city's history. Uh, the Public Works Department and in town are working together to address and keep our city streets clean. Uh, the city and Granite United Way are funding a city employee that will be dedicated to focusing on the issues related to homelessness, so a point person within the city uh, to address this. Uh, we have certainly, as a city, been advocating at the state level for increases in affordable housing investments. And currently in the state, in the Senate budget, uh, there is an allotment of $5 million in, in additional money uh, for affordable housing, which certainly uh, would be utilized here in the city. And um, as Mike mentioned, and you'll be hearing more uh, from Patrick Tufts, uh, we instituted uh, a task force uh, specifically focused on homelessness in the city with over 60 people participating. Uh, it was an amazing uh, learning experience and a great opportunity for us to hear uh, from individuals throughout the city. So, uh, you know, as Mike did, I want to specifically thank a few uh, people, Patrick Tufts from the Granite United Way, Mike yourself from the Greater Chamber, uh, Sarah Beaudry from In Town Manchester, uh, Aaron from Waypoint, uh, Sean Owen from We Do, uh, Anna Thomas from our health department, uh, Chief Capano and Solicitor Rice uh, from the city, and Maureen Beauregard and Kathy Kuhn, who have participated greatly in doing research and getting an understanding of the situation within the city and working on this task force uh, on their efforts and making sure that we are making pr progress on this. Um, I also want to thank Kim Roy uh, from the Doubletree for hosting us today and thank all of you again for being here. Uh, I look forward to hearing specifically from you uh, your ideas and your thoughts on what's been accomplished uh, to date and how we can best move forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I, I'd now like to introduce Patrick Tufts, who's the CEO of the Granite United Way. Do you come up and share with us a little overview of the task force report that uh, the mayor just referenced? Um, having participated in that effort, it was uh, a learning experience for myself as well. Uh, I would encourage everyone to log on to the city website. The report is available on there if you haven't reviewed it. Um, and uh, ask Patrick to walk us through at a high level um, uh, what is in that report and what are some of the recommendations of which there are many. So Patrick, take it away. Great. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank Mayor Craig for asking me to participate in this important process. Uh, the Granite United Way was happy to provide staff support and logistics support to this um, task force. Uh, just a couple of high-level notes. Uh, we chose to do this quickly. We knew that um, we needed to refresh the city's plan to end homelessness, which was commissioned in 2008. Uh, that was over 10 years ago. And we had had some great accomplishments in the city, but we also had things that we were struggling with. Many of the things have been mentioned or, or we'll dive into a little bit tonight. So we set a pretty ambitious uh, process. We wanted to have a conversation over the period of eight weeks, and we started with 38 task force members which quickly grew to over 60 because people really wanted to be in the room and they wanted to share ideas on what was working and more importantly, what, what wasn't working. We created a document and it is available on the city website. It is not a strategic plan. It is not one of these 100 page documents that has lots of different pages and graphs and charts. It's really a set of recommendations that came directly from over 60 professionals and providers in the room to say what we think we need to do as a city to improve upon this situation. What are some of the gaps? You know, we heard from the business community, we heard from not-for-profit leaders, we heard from municipal folks, and we had some really thoughtful conversations. Again, with the intention not to solve homelessness in eight weeks, but try to point ourselves in the right direction to improve this very complex issue. We finished the process in the first week of April and presented to the Board of Mayor and Alderman where the plan was approved. We approached our work through four primary subcommittees, which you'll hear a little bit more about tonight. Again, we could have addressed lots of different things, but we decided to focus on panhandling. And Mike Skelton from the Chamber of Commerce led that conversation. We dove into outreach services, 
and community support, which Erin Kelly from Waypoint led that conversation. We looked at housing stock and sector capacity. I mean, what do we have the capacity to do in our city? What do we need more of? And that was led by Sean Owen of WeDo. We added a fourth group as we dove into the conversation and said, what do we really need to be doing upstream to improve this situation in the future so that 10 years from now, we're not having the same conversation? So we added a prevention task force, prevention subcommittee, led by Anna Thomas. Uh, Mike said this and the mayor said this. This is my fourth one of these strategic conversations. Uh, I've worked in Portland, Maine on this. I've worked in Manchester twice and Concord. Uh, this is a very complex issue and it's very dynamic. It moves. So the second we think we have things figured out, there's something new that we have to deal with. So what we need to do as a community is have very open ears we need to work together and collaborate, and we need to be dynamic too. We need to be willing to try different things, and I was really honored to be part of this conversation. Nobody talked anybody else down. Nobody overspoke over it about anybody else. Everybody worked together to try to put good ideas out there that we can put into motion as quickly as possible on behalf of this city. And it is a dynamic plan, and we'll learn from you tonight, from your questions. If there's something we missed, Tell us. If there's something we can do better, we'll work with you. Um, we haven't set future meetings for the task force, but I've heard from almost every single member that would be willing to come together again and set new recommendations to put into place. And I second what the mayor said. It's really very um, encouraging to me to see so many of the recommendations that are in this plan already happening. There's still some that we need to work on and get into place, and some are more longer term. But there's already things that we committed to in the first week in April that are already happening, and I think that's just a great demonstration of collaboration and the fact that we're all working together. So again, my pleasure to work on this. I advise you or I ask you to please look on the city website, look over the recommendations. If we've missed something, please work with us to get it on the table. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Patrick, and, and thank you to, for your work and leadership in bringing that task force together. Again, I would encourage everybody to go check it out if you haven't seen it. Uh, it looks like this, and again, is available on the, uh, on the city website for download and for your perusal. Um, so at this point, I'd like to introduce the folks who are joining me here at the front of the room. Uh, starting over at the side, I have Anna Thomas, who's the public health director for the city of Manchester. Uh, Kathy Kuhn, who's the Vice President of Research and Training for Fit New Horizons, Erin Kelly, who's a Director at Waypoint, and Maureen Beauregard, who's the President of Fit New Horizons. Um, I have a few questions to get the conversation started uh, for these uh, folks here, and uh, I think they represent a, a huge chunk of the information and action and work being done in our community on this issue, and there, are, as I mentioned earlier, there are others in the room who can address other components. Um, but at this point, I'd like to just, uh, you know, say that you're more than welcome to participate. We have a microphone up here in the front. If you have a question, feel free to come up. Um, we also put note cards on the aisle seats. Um, so if you have a question that you'd like to submit but would not like to ask it, feel free to write it down. Um, someone from my team will, will be able to pick that up and bring it up to me. Um, we really want your feedback, as Patrick noted. That's in, important to us. So um, uh, I, I want to invite you to participate really here from the get-go. Uh, don't uh, be afraid to jump right in. Tonight is about having a conversation and, and hearing from all of you, whether it's suggestions, feedback, ideas. Uh, we really are interested in everything. So uh, with that, I want to dive in and give each of you a chance maybe just to introduce yourself and. I know one of the things as someone who does not work in this space for a living, uh, participating in the task force was a learning experience for me and learning about what is the role of all the agencies and nonprofits in our community and what they do and how they engage in this specific issue of homelessness. So as a start, I'm wondering if each of you could just provide a, a quick background on your role and what your organization does and specifically as it relates to homelessness. You know, what, do, what activities do you engage on 
uh, on a daily basis or weekly basis, regular basis uh, related to this issue. So if you guys want to flip that mic on and uh, you can take it right out of the, the holster there too. And Anna, why don't you uh, kick us off? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for giving us this opportunity to speak. And I'm very eager to speak with all of you. Um, I've been with the city for the past 25 years and have been the public health director for nine years and have been the deputy uh, for 11. And back in 1987, the health department um, brought through federal funding health care for the homeless to the city. And we contract with Catholic Medical Center to provide primary health care. Um, for our most vulnerable. And I know we have some staff here tonight, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, and some board members. Um, so thank you all for coming too. Uh, they are now seeing a census of about 1,700 unduplicated people in a year. And uh, that number has grown incrementally year by year. Um, it's predominantly adults. And we also, as a health department, have under us all of the school nurses. So we know very real time what's happening with children and families as well. And, um, and, I'm, and my colleagues will probably speak to this, but we are seeing in the schools anywhere from six to 800 unduplicated um, school children were identified as homeless or displaced by the school district and about half of those children are of elementary age. So this is something that has grown over many, many years in development. Um, I will tell you, you know, we're a city of about 110,000 uh, population, about 35,000 people are living at 200% of poverty. So we have a subset of that population who are homeless or displaced, but we have an even deeper subset of that population that are at risk for homelessness. Um, and I hope in, you know, where my kind of role sits at this table is the upstream prevention role. I hope we can do more in that arena to try to avert um, a lot of folks that we're seeing now that are really in crisis and um, we desperately need our help. So I'll stop. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kathy Coon. I'm with Families and Transition New Horizons. Um, I'm going to let Marine tell you a little bit about Families and Transition New Horizons. Um, but I also serve as the Vice Chair of the Manchester Continuum of Care. And I think there might be some folks in the room who may not be familiar of, the, of this organization or this network. And it really is very important um, in terms of the work that we do on homelessness City. So for folks who might not be familiar with the Manchester Continuum of Care, um, we really are sort of the organized network of agencies within the city whose work, you know, sort of touches on the, home, on the homeless in, in some way. And so, you know, as everyone has said, Patrick mentioned earlier, homelessness is very complex. And so the membership base of this organization is very purposefully diverse. So, you know, we have um, homeless service providers, certainly, who are a part of it. Um, but we also have, you know, city departments um, who are part of the continuum of care, um, you know, the school district, an array of other sort of nonprofits who are really important and in sort of having an impact on this issue in Manchester. And so we come together regularly. Um, if anyone is, these are public meetings, we meet every other month um, at 9 a.m. Um, and so if folks are interested in becoming, you know, coming to one of our meetings and learning more about the Manchester Continuum of Care, um, we can certainly provide you with that information. My name is Erin Kelly, and I'm the director at Waypoint, which is a private nonprofit here in Manchester. We provide an array of services for individuals, everything from babies in utero all the way up to home care for the elderly. And so I oversee all of our homeless youth programs, um, which means homeless young people who are unaccompanied from their parents or legal guardians. So we serve young people as young as 12 and all the way up to their 23rd birthday who might be on their own couch surfing, moving from place to place, and trying to make it and figure out how to um, stabilize. In addition to that, I'm also the chair of the Manchester Continuum of Care, which Kathy just told you about, so I'm not going to go into that any further. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that here in Manchester, we um, have also put together a collaboration of organizations focused on the issue of youth homelessness, including organizations like the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club, and many other youth serving organizations in the community because 
young people are a very invisible population. They um, are often the ones that are undercounted because at 15 or 16 years old, you're not going in and telling your math teacher or your guidance counselor that you slept in your car last night. So it takes a little bit more work to really identify the young people in our community who are experiencing homelessness. And unfortunately, it is a population that is increasing year after year. So we are working very hard as a community in Manchester to be able to look at how we develop a strategic plan to prevent and end youth homelessness in Manchester, in addition to all of the other work on homelessness that we are continuing to do. I'm Maureen Beauregard. I'm with Families in Transition to Horizons. And Mary Slaney and I are like the grandmothers of the COC. We started it back in 1995, and it's great that it's still going. Um, we've been able to leverage a lot of federal resources to help us today um, dealing with the issue of homelessness. So if folks know, I, think, I believe, know a lot about each organization. Um, Families in Transition started as an organization working with mothers and children, and over time, we've worked with all populations and we provide an array of um, various housing options for people and we also have uh, programs program specific um, programs like substance disorder programming child programming um, and we're very proud of those services as well as the housing that we've developed over time we merged with new horizons it feels like 10 years ago but it's like more like two and a half a year and a half um, and we feel that we've made great progress and really looking at the why and you know that has been one of the things that families in transition and horizons that um, would like you to think about is the why why are people um, homeless why are they outside and hopefully today you'll get more insight into that when we look at the numbers uh, at new horizons they've been around a thousand and they've been around a thousand unduplicated numbers for a few years and then at families in transition we have a wait list of about 150 families, and probably around 60, Kathy, you can correct me on that, probably around that, around 60 families uh, are waiting in places not meant for human habitation to come into the 11 units that we have. And that those numbers have been pretty steady over the years. Um, and uh, so hopefully today we'll be able to get into some of the, what I feel are um, root cause uh, responses to being able to help people up and out of homelessness, some of the changes that we're making, whether it be structurally or with our attitude. So we really look forward to talking to you more about that. Great, thank you. And Maureen, if you can hang on to that mic, I'm gonna pose another question. But again, just want to encourage if anyone would like to ask questions of the panel or provide a comment, feel free to come on up or use those, those note cards. Um, one of the uh, goals of this conversation and, and others like it is is better understanding of this very complex issue. I think all of us at some point or another tonight have, have mentioned that how complex and dynamic this, this issue is. So I'm wondering if each of you could offer your thoughts on kind of how things have changed. Um, you know, I think it was referenced earlier by Patrick that there's been uh, several efforts in this city um, to address homelessness, and we're also not alone. There's cities all over the country that are uh, grappling with this issue, and it's unique in, in many different places. So, Maureen, from your perspective, I'm wondering if you could share just how you think homelessness has changed. Um, are there new challenges? Have there been areas of improvement that encourage you? I, I'm not just trying to be outside and yellow here, but I do feel that um, that there are so many opportunities uh, that have that have finally come to fruition for those that we serve. We've been waiting a long time to be able to really call together these resources. Um, we've always worked together and um, historically, and the time has never been better than now to actually get to the why and do something. The group of us went to San Francisco to um, to see how they do it out there. And when, when I came back, I went to the mayor and I'm like, we, we can do this. Um, if you really want to see something that's intractable, go to San Francisco, go to Seattle. And when you come back and you look at what's happening here, there are things that we can do. You know, when we think about homeless people, 
we need to remember that it's about housing and that there isn't enough housing for people who are very poor. We talk about affordable housing, which we need. We talk about housing in general for the general public. We talk about affordable housing or workforce housing. We don't really talk a whole lot about housing for people who are low income or very low income because it carries such a stigma. And when you look out and you see people out, um, outside, these, these are your worker bees. These are people who are trying to make it. So housing affordability for the very poor. When we look at the folks that we serve, we're also looking at a system that has been dismantled that we're trying to put back together again, whether it be the mental health system or the substance use disorder treatment programs. Those were dismantled. And I always like compare to like, you're on this fast moving train and you're throwing down tracks in front of you and we're trying to rebuild this substance use disorder treatment system that absolutely has been dismantled and really caught us on our heels. So when you look at the general population, um, the population we serve really aren't much different um, in that they have been really affected by these things. And um, I think that the one thing that I want people to think about when they see people homeless is that one of the, the most under-reported um, things is health issues amongst the homeless, specifically folks who are operating kind of at a developmental disability level for folks with a traumatic brain injury. People have, that is one thing that I just really want to beat the drum on is that people with both of those are overrepresented in the homeless community. I have been doing work in Manchester with homeless young people for the last 10 years. And 10 years ago when I started this work, it felt like there was a pathway out of poverty for these young people. If we could give them some skills, if we could help them connect to employment and help them to get on their feet, they could gain those things and then probably make it. Even if they lived paycheck to paycheck um, and struggled or needed resources for most of the rest of their lives, they could get out of homelessness. Today, it does not feel that way. Our young people are coming to us with complex issues. Um, previously, we had young people coming to us who had some protective factors, probably had a supportive, healthy adult somewhere along the line who taught them some things, who loved them, who took care of them. Most of our young people today are young people who have an experience of lifetime of complex trauma. So at 15, 16, 17 years old, the amount of protective factors they have is very little. And we are working in our programs to really make up for the fact that they haven't had safe or supportive adults in their lives or any sort of stability Many of our young people don't even know what it means to have a home because they've been in and out of shelters and in and out of uh, the cycle of eviction throughout their lives with their families. So we're looking at cycles of poverty and inter intergenerational poverty in our community and the effects of that on our young people. And as Maureen said, the picture is not all grim because this is the first time that we have really been able to feel like there is all the motivators behind changing the trajectory of this problem. In Manchester, this problem is solvable. We can end homelessness in Manchester because even though it feels like a very complex issue, it is not to the point where we are overburdened to an extent that it cannot be reversed. So the fact that we're having these conversations and we have the political motivation and the support and we are willing to think about what resources it's going to take to change it is very different than when we got it, when I got into this work 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, with all of that. Um, you know, as everyone has said, homelessness is complex. There are a lot of different issues that could pull an individual or a family into homelessness. Um, but for me, you know, the fundamental cause of homelessness is really this connection between um, poverty and the lack of affordable housing in our community. So we know that people who are working minimum wage jobs, there's absolutely no way that they can afford housing in this market. 
and many people who are on fixed incomes um, are never going to be able to afford housing um, in Manchester. And so rents keep going up and vacancy rates keep getting lower and it becomes harder and harder for people to um, afford housing. And for many folks, they, they're just not, they're not going to be able to afford housing without a subsidy. Um, but as we know, the subsidy is, you know, there's a very, very long wait list, wait list for any sort of housing subsidy um, in the city and, and in our, our state. So, you know, the bottom line is that, you know, as this gap continues to widen between what people, you know, their incomes and the cost of housing, more and more families are at risk of homelessness. But I, I can't, you know, I just want to echo everything that Maureen and Aaron just said is that we are in a really unique moment where there is so much energy um, and, and you know, positivity behind this issue, so much willingness to really make, make an impact and, and look at it. Um, and so, you know, I, I am encouraged that we're really going to take advantage of this of this positive energy and, and make really significant change in Manchester. Um, you know, the only thing I can add to that is, you know, the one thing that I fell in love with with Manchester 25 years ago is the fact that this community will rally around itself. And when we are faced with some sort of challenge, especially when it's a cross-cutting one like this, um, there's a lot of grit, you know, here. There's a lot of fight to uh, see that through. And I think even though we've kind of heard through our task force meetings and other community meetings, there's a lot of frustration with this as an issue. I think people just can't see, see the end of it. Um, the one thing I also feel is that there's just an enormous commitment you know, from all of you. you. You can complain about it all you want or you can actually be part of the solution, right? That's why we're here. We're all, we're all leaders in this. And that's gonna take a little bit of each of us to give a little and be part of that bigger picture. And I also think we have to um, kind of drive the work as upstream as we can and to get ahead of that curve so we don't keep feeding the pipeline. You know, it's something that we started years ago and, and some of the partners in the room um, who helped us with this was um, we started to really heavily co-locate in schools because we knew we had a captive audience. We had targeted schools, a lot of kids in crisis in those schools, and families in crisis. And we have the generosity of organizations like the Manchester Community Health Center and the Mental Health Center of Greater Manchester who have chosen to co-locate staff in the schools to help problem solve with families right there and then when we have them. And that's a new layer of work and that really gives us an opportunity to get to the parents of these kids and to really prevent the next generation of homelessness as well. So we're trying to do things like teach financial literacy. You know, a lot of families don't even know how to balance a checkbook. You know, we're trying to teach families, um, help them help the adults get their high school diplomas along with the kids who are going to school at the same time. Um, we're trying to give people life skills and leadership skills so they can kind of persevere in the face of adversity. And that's what we want. We want a resilient community at the end of the day. I think we all have that same goal. It's just how we get from here to there. It's gonna take time. Um, and in my time of, of watching the community change, I would say the one thing that I do feel is a challenge before us is this is also a resourcing issue. You know, this costs money. At the end of the day, to do this well, to stay with people through what they need, that it's not just a one and done. You're with them at different points of the lifespan. And there's different gradients of homelessness, which I'm sure we're gonna talk about. You know, those who are chronically homeless to those who are just like in and out of it on the fringe. And they all need different levels of intervention. Um, so we're really trying to work with the funders and philanthropy and the businesses in the community and private investors to maybe align resources so we can start bringing things to scale. Because that's what it's gonna take. You know, we're talking hundreds of lives that we really wanna change for the better. And that's gonna take a lot of resourcing. And you know, that's the building, I think that's in the next phase of this work. It's, it's really gonna be um, something in front of us. Thanks, Anna, and that's a great segue to the next question, um, but I do want to keep plugging, I'm going to keep doing it until we get a brave volunteer from the audience. Sir, are you walking up to the podium? Uh, I'm walking up to the stick. Perfect, thank you. So, Could you share your name too, sir? Sure, my name is Keith Howard. Um, I'm a formerly homeless person, 
And I'm assuming that in addition to all the blue ribbon talent that was on this task force, there also was representation from the homeless community. I'm just wondering what the differences were in the way that you assess the, that professionals assess the problem versus the way that folks who are homeless assess the problem and potential solutions. I know there was representation um, on the task force, but which one of you would like to tackle that? We have been um, really working hard on the communication with the folks that are served at. Um, tonight I'm going to talk mostly about Ben Horizons. And folks that are on the streets that have no place to go, they need to be not just um, a conversation, but a part of the solution. And they have really driven everything we're doing at Ten Horizons. There's nothing that we're doing that hasn't been discussed and vetted with folks that uh, are coming to the shelter. And uh, we now provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you know, there's a gentleman who came in, he's like, I'm starving, and it was like five o'clock. He's a young guy, and um, hadn't eaten all day. Um, we have looked at the rules. We've talked a lot about the rules, and we're working in partnership with folks on that. Um, we are renovating the second floor, thanks in part to the mayor and the board of mayor and all of it, because people didn't feel safe, um, and quite frankly, didn't want to use the facilities, nor would I. Uh, so those are all a direct result. And when talking to people, um, I love, I, I just love New Horizons. I love going there. And I'm like, Brian, if we built like permanent supportive housing and you're in your own room, would that do? What do you want? He's like, that would be great. So we're, we are including them every step along the way. I myself go down on um, Elm Street all the time um, because people are like, I'm not allowed there, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, now you know you are. Like, that's not true. So um, it, the most magical piece of the change that's happening at New Horizons is the voice of those that are from the perspective of youth homelessness, Waypoint has something called the Youth Action Board. And if anyone knows anybody who is under the age of 25 and has lived experience in homelessness, we would love for them to join our Youth Action Board. And we call it a Youth Action Board because they are not our advisory committee. They are the committee that approves all of the policy changes and decisions that we make within our programs. And we are also utilizing them as we look to try to expand um, and try to really assess the needs of the community of Manchester to be able to think about how we develop a strategic community-wide strategy to prevent and end youth homelessness. Because the phrase, if you build it, they will come, does not actually happen in reality. Because if we build it from the adult perspective, youth won't come. They will only come if they have buy-in and they have participation and they have ownership. And so we give them that because they are the experts in what it means to be a homeless young person in Manchester. It is not me. Thank you for the question, sir. And I, maybe I could add to what you guys are responding to. If you could explain the outreach services that the different agencies in the community provide and what that entails in terms of um, talking to homeless individuals and working with them and trying to get them to access services. Sure, so part of the continuum of care here in Manchester is an outreach subcommittee, which is comprised of a group of organizations who all have at least one person or part of an FPE that's dedicated to outreach, outreaching in the community. And outreach truly means boots on the ground. So we are out in the parks, under bridges, in the woods, on the trails, out in the encampments, really going to the places where homeless individuals in our community are living and congregating. And um, that happens across the spectrum. So there are some people like outreach workers from Waypoint who have a focus on young people. We have. Um, outreach workers that are focused on veterans, we have outreach workers that are focused on mental health issues, we have outreach workers that are focused on substance abuse issues, 
And so we really, as a group, sort of cover the spectrum and really try to talk to every individual that we see out in the community. And part of that is just building relationships because engaging individuals in services means that they need to feel like they matter and that somebody cares about them because that's the first step in getting them through our door. So part of outreach and understanding outreach means that sometimes we talk to the same person on the street five, six, seven, eight, nine times before they're ready to actually come into a building and access services. So we have consistent outreach in the community on a regular basis so that we can build those relationships and continually reach out to the same individuals and inform them about the services in the community and invite them to those services. And sometimes that means that right then and there we're walking somebody to the shelter to say, hey, dinner started 15 minutes ago. Let's go to New Horizons and we'll get you dinner and help you get connected to a staff so that you can get a bed there tonight. Um, so we do a lot of outreach in our community and we're looking to try to expand that to meet the capacity. And one quick note that we could certainly speak to if there's other interest, but I know um, outreach services are being ramped up. Um, there are some new outreach resources being added um, uh, thanks to, I believe, some state funding as well and elsewhere in the community. So um, that's something we could explain more if there is interest. Um, again, Come on up if you have questions. Yes, sure. Come on. Thank you, awesome job. Appreciate all you're doing. Uh, with regards to affordable housing, workforce housing, you hear those words play a lot on the public. What is the true affordable for a family of three or four or three bedrooms versus the workforce housing? I mean, I hear newer housing at $1,500 a month. It doesn't sound affordable. And this is where the housing subsidy is so important because what is affordable is typically established by HUD as 30% of a person's income. So if they have zero income, then their rent would be zero to make it affordable for them. And this is where the housing subsidy is so, so important because we need that assistance to help people bridge the gap between what they can actually afford and what the rent actually is. And so that's where you know we're sort of seeing that gap in, in services where people are, are paying 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, all of their income going towards rent, and then that leaves them without any, you know, any income for any of their other basic necessities. So when we're talking about affordability, we really need to be thinking about affordability for the very low income, those who really have very, you know, no to little income, which is mostly the population that we're talking about here. That's a good segue back to a, another question I think we wanted to ask about which is again this is a learning experience for myself is that you know I think uh, for those not familiar who don't work in this you assume that the homeless population looks all the same there are people in the same conditions um, same situation um, but that's that's not the case and you know Anna you, you mentioned that you know one of your primary concerns is the folks who are right on the edge where that are housing unstable and, and could easily fall into the homeless or those that that you know jump in and out of the homeless population um, so that, that's an important dynamic to this issue I'm wondering if, if you guys can address that or better explain that to what are the, the categories or you know the different um, if we were to understand the layers of this issue you know what, what does that look like We have a broad definition of health as a health department, and, and the Institute of Medicine defines health as the ability to function in the face of changing circumstances. So it's no longer a facet of the absence of disease or somebody with disease, it's someone's ability to function. And when you see someone on the street who is not in control of themselves, you know, you have to ask that big question of, do they have an ability to function in the face of changing circumstances? So to us, that would constitute someone who's unhealthy. So we have to look at it in the broadest sense of then, how do we start to early identify people who may be facing crisis in their lives, may be teetering on the edge, and it may even start with employers. You know, For those um, in the city who have workplace wellness programs, you know, how are you problem solving with employees if they fall on hard times? You know, 
Do we not take responsibility for that? Do we not help them? Or are we there to try to you know, make referrals to resources that would help avert them um, leading themselves you know, down the path of not being able to function? So I think for us, you know, we're trying to find new ways of trying to get to people before they get to that state. You know, and what's it going to take? And where are the places where we might capture them in that way? Um, and that's why, it's one of the reasons why we went into the schools. We, we had a captive audience there. We had families that we could early identify. That's just one place. I think there's lots of places. I know um, Maureen has often talked about, you know, it would be great if we stood up sort of neighborhood emergency response centers or places where people could go who might be in crisis. I know Brandy Nataway has a phenomenal model that's it's Work United where they'll co-locate providers and workplaces to be a resource for employees when um, you know, they've got issues you know, coming up and, and can't find a way through them. So I think there's great models out there. I just think we've never really looked at that comprehensively in the community and mapped that out. And I, and I think there's a great opportunity before I let others chime in on that, sir, if you could uh, go ahead, come on up okay. and ask your question. If you can introduce yourself as well. Yeah, my name is uh, Chip Spangler. I live on the western side of Manchester. And I know that uh, Seattle was mentioned before. And one of the things that I've done, I've studied Seattle a little bit. And one of the things I found was that in 2009, uh, there was the start of uh, micro housing. So people were starting to develop smaller things. And over the next six or seven years, what ended up happening is that more regulations uh, got put in place and NIMBY happened and basically it destroyed the market for small housing over there. And I was wondering if uh, similar things to what they did wrong there, has that been studied as far as what we have in Manchester right now as far as zoning regulations, as far as uh, you know other restrictions that may have been in place that may prevent the development of those smaller housing, whether it's boarding houses or micro apartments or things like that. Has that been studied in Manchester? I don't believe it has. And I know that um, um, small houses is something that people are very interested in. Uh, accessory dwelling units are, I, I think, um, finally okay. And I think that that can help the market overall. One of the things that we've been successful at, and New Hampshire Housing is in the room, um, they have been very supportive of us building single room occupancy housing. And, um, and I feel that now is the time to be able to really take that and run with it. Um, the housing trust fund funds are coming down from the feds and New Hampshire housing, they've always been willing to work with us. Um, now is the time to really, really look at those funds and say, how do we take advantage of this while it lasts? Because there has been a walk away from HUD at the national level on being able to really look at this issue holistically. What Mary and I started back in 1995 no longer exists in regards to the resources that we would bring in. We could apply for bricks and sticks to build housing, operate it, and provide services. They walked away from that, um, which is a part of the reason why we're, why we're where we're at. It's encouraging to me that we now have the Housing Trust Fund. New Hampshire Housing is putting other resources in that, and they are willing to go as quickly as we can on this. So I think that's the closest that we've come on that, but I know tons of people are interested in that. Thank you for the- We're also doing a 10 year plan, uh, which is looking at building uh, throughout the city so it's an opportunity and the public again will be involved in that for us to look at the city as a whole and are we doing what we should be in the same I just want to put a plug in that whenever we've gone to the city with a project, um, and whenever we've been able to go to New Hampshire Housing, we get the resources, and when we go to the city, we get those projects approved, which is pretty amazing. Thank you for the question, sir. And just before I move on, I did want to <clears throat> specifically mention that the Housing and Sector Capacity Subcommittee of the task force that was referenced earlier, I think you know, your question, sir, is targeted right to what they were trying to answer, which is understanding you know, what do we have now and what are the strategies we need to have in the future to build that, that right amount of options. So, yes ma'am, please. My name is Jillian Real, and I'm an attorney who provides direct services to victims and survivors of domestic violence here in the Manchester. Many of my clients suffer from homelessness as a result of domestic violence, but they're often not convenient, so they're not a good candidate for an emergency domestic 
provide them shelter because they're not a good fit. And a lot of times, my clients have kids. Are there resources that are being developed to try to meet this need that we know is going very much unmet right now? So it's a challenge. Um, there are, so much of the funding that comes in is directed by federal priorities. So there are different sort of criteria associated with who we can and who we cannot serve. Um, women who are fleeing domestic violence are certainly prioritized for many of those
And I think it's also about making sure that the places that we want people to come into are places that we would want to go into. And so this is where you know the mayor's, the city's um, investment in the shelter at, at New Horizons is so so important. Um, you know, New Horizons absolutely needs um, you know a, a rehab, and so we're working on doing that um, right now. But we need to make sure that those places are welcoming and that the services that are provided there are ones that um, are really sort of enticing people, you know, to come in and that their needs are actually getting getting met. So, um, so I think it's so important that you know the, the places where we're asking people to come into are the types of places um, that we would want to go into ourselves. And the only thing I want to add is, you know, I think with um, healthcare for the homeless, you know, I think. We often see through that mechanism sort of the full range of what's happening in someone's life to kind of get back to that definition of health. So there's lots of layers, so to your point, of seeing someone struggling with addiction, potentially, or somebody with mental behavioral health issues. Um, there, when you start to peel that onion, you know, it goes pretty deep. Like, how, where do we start? Um, and it goes back to that ability to function. And, and one of the things that Healthcare for the Homeless is doing it's already co-located at New Horizons and Families in Transition. It's expanding a third access point in the fall, um, to their credit, at the Manchester Treatment and Recovery Center, which is a newly stood up um, set of organizations coming together, which will provide primary health care, but also with an emphasis on substance use disorders and mental behavioral health. And I think that's the way we have to think about this, because there are lots of issues going on at the same time. You know, and how do we start to dissect it case by case um, to try to get people in a better state of functioning? Sir, did you have a question? And just while he's coming up, one last thing I just want on this point. Um, mm -hmm. Your question or your comment about the perception of public safety downtown is extremely important um, to all of us, especially you know myself as uh, leading the chamber, which cares about our business climate. And I just wanted to mention that in addition to all the other things we've talked about, um, this conversation has also caused us to look at other things that influence the perception of public safety downtown. Um, so in working with the city, we're looking at lighting and beautification and some other improvements that we can make that can contribute towards improving that perception. Sir. All right, my name is Ryan Dewey. Uh, I'm very for this year. I lost my job. I'm to be I lost my place to live. And I got to experience my residence firsthand for a couple months. Um, and I ended up in the hospital, I almost died, but I was in the worst thing. I'm walking, thank God. I wasn't sure if that was going to happen my life, but. Um, so from my experience of being able to see this firsthand, um, just being in that experience, one, is, can be pretty depressing, and it's easy to fall into depression. Luckily, I had some motivation, I had a baby coming, and I, actively searching for a job. I went to college with my savings. Took a kick out of school. I didn't kick out of school. I missed most of the school. I was in hospital. But the dean's working for me. Um, so that's one thing. Just being in a situation can be very depressing, whether there's substance use issues or not. Other things I've noticed was people who are trying to find jobs. It's really difficult when shower access is iffy and they're worried about the possessions. It's kind of difficult when you're going to apply for a job and you got a backpack and a bag of laundry and everything else you're carrying with you. I know New Horizons had an area where they could keep stuff and that was, I think you had to have a job to be able to keep it there. So people looking for a job are still carrying around their items. Um, another thing was people that are trying to get off substances and looking for help. There's waiting lists on all these beds. Volunteer at Hope for New Hampshire a lot, and they have resources. There's places out of state that have open availabilities, but they have to worry about getting the bus tickets there and everything. So, those are some of the main issues I noticed. This panhandling, yeah, homeless people love that eating food though, because eating better when I was homeless than when I was working 70 hours a week because I didn't have time to eat. Uh, New Horizons, 1269 Cafe, Harmony Home all offer at least lunch, not the meals. And most of the time they're just looking for money to get their next beer or whatever. And, um, 
if you got that, because sometimes when they get that money, they're less desperate. And so when people get desperate and start throwing in DTs or jonesing, where they start being willing to do more aggressive actions. And so that's my only issue totally against paying. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you very much for speaking up. So we talked about how we're renovating the second floor and the bathrooms that were there are gone and there'll be brand new bathrooms and um, thank goodness. And um, with support from the city, we're able to get that done. The bathrooms on the first floor will be redone. And I have to tell you that prior to this, I wouldn't have used them myself. And there's nothing more stigmatizing than carrying everything you own on your back. That is something that um, New Horizons is, it looks big, but it's really this big. And we're trying to shoehorn so many things in there. Um, and we're trying to unpack things in a way that it doesn't cause total chaos. It's a beginning, a middle, and the end. We're in the middle where things are like a little chaotic because people have to go someplace to sleep at night while we do the upstairs. But we are really going to be turning a corner on the conditions and that is essential. We're going to be creating safe recovery shelter so that if you don't want to use tonight and you want a safe place where others aren't using, you're going to have access to that within the four walls of the shelter. That's brand new. What a safety thing. The, um, the, um, the women's shelter and the men's shelter is going to have a locked door. That isn't something that was ever available. Um, and we're going to increase the number of staffing from one team of two staff for 150 people. And we're going to end up with more like four teams 24-7 to be able to help people to feel safe within the shelter. We still need to work on the, um, the backpacks. And I have an idea for that. We just have to get this phase done because the next phase that I'm going to be looking to do will also need some construction. Um, I'm not looking to give her money there. We'll be able to figure it out. Don't look at her. Um, but we're going to need to move some walls around in the pantry so that people can leave their things. I think it's so horrible that you have everything on your back. Everything you own is on your back. There's one, there's one. So we're going to figure out a way that you can leave your stuff here um, with us and you can go do your job. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jake Perry. I live in Ward 2. First, I want to uh, thank you all for the uh, thoughtful and comprehensive and respectful approach you've taken this whole thing. And I think that, uh, uh, that approach has been lacking a little bit in our public dialogue uh, around these issues in some ways. Uh, that said, there are just a few things I want to note that I know I don't need to tell you all, but I want to repeat for everyone else. Uh, substance use disorder or addiction is a uh, chronic, relapsing medical condition. Uh, it, Mental illness in all its many forms uh, is every bit the uh, medical uh, concern uh, as the addiction is. Uh, these are not poor choices. These are diseases to be treated, uh, not arrested. Not to get out. Of it. Uh, secondly, uh, I fully acknowledge that you guys are absolutely right about our approach in, in urging uh, people downtown not to donate to panhandlers. That said, I worry a little bit about the emphasis on that message and that it distracts from some of the larger, uh, more systemic infrastructure issues that we are facing as a city. Uh, thirdly, I want to ask, I guess the question I'll leave you with is asking what we can do to better engage uh, unlikely partners, whether it's the private sector, the faith community, uh, other partners who are not uh, around the table or not contributing to this in every way. And then the last point I want to leave you with is I grew up in this city and I'm choosing to raise my three-year-old boys here. Uh, one of the things I love about this community is the diversity, that's the ethnic diversity and the economic diversity. Uh, and I love that we uh, take care of each other. And so thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't need to keep taking the mic, but we had our walk against hunger um, just about a week or so ago. And we're trying to be more mission-based in our events. And so we decided that we would change the route and we would walk along some of the facilities that families in transition to Horizon Zones, which means we went by New Horizons, which means we went to Spruce Street, up to the Hollows, over to Wilson Street, and by a couple other buildings. 
And um, a majority of people thought that was a great idea that we get to actually see why we're doing what we're doing. Um, what's surprising is that some people aren't going to walk again and aren't going to fund us because it's too hard. It was too hard. It was not pretty. Um, and the neighborhoods didn't look good. And those are the realities of what we see every day. And um, I appreciate the gentleman that just spoke. I moved here um, a year ago for the very same reasons that he did. And uh, I love Manchester, and I'm committed to Manchester, all of it. Not just parts of it, but all of it. I drive through the center city on purpose because the few that make it unsafe or the few that aren't so nice, I'm going like that to them. Like, <laughs> we live here too, and this is our city. So I think a couple of points that that gentleman that was just up here um, asked about is that we did recognize that there were some people that should be around the table working on this issue and um, having a say in this issue that weren't at the table. And one of the things that we haven't always done well in our community is to connect social service providers and the faith-based community together and to have a bridge that connects both of them so that we're working together with the same mission and goal. And so a few weeks ago, we actually had an event at um, St. A's where um, the mayor had invited a um, pastor from Ohio who works on just this thing, bridging the gap between social service organizations and faith-based communities. And we had an opportunity to spend a day together where uh, stakeholders across the faith-based organizations and social service organizations were in the same room really talking about if we're gonna make changes in our community and we're really gonna impact our community, how we need to do this better together because that's the only way that it's gonna happen. And so um, we are continuing to build relationships from that day and thinking about how we can actually put those things into action in our community um, from that event and moving forward so that we are working together with the same um, goal in mind and I would like to say that I too live in Manchester and this is my community and like Maureen um, I hang out in Manchester I love going to my city library and um, being part of the community because I love Manchester all of its beauty and diversity and its grit is my home yeah, and I would just say as well that, you know, homeless, in homeless services, we know that we cannot do it alone. So the last two gentlemen that spoke really talked about sort of the complexities associated with homelessness. So we need to have that cross-sector collaboration from, you know, employment services, medical services, physical health, mental health, behavioral health, you know, the school districts, all of us need to be together uh, working on this issue because we are all impacted on that. And there are a number of new initiatives happening within the Manchester Continual Care that are very exciting around this issue. One is led by Matt Bushi from the uh, Mental Health Center, which is called the Community Care Team, where we're bringing together providers um, from multiple sectors to really talk specifically about specific complex cases so that we're sure that we're bringing in resources from all of these different sectors to, um, to really make an impact on these really complex cases. So there's a lot happening um, in terms of collaboration and it's really exciting and it's certainly um, so needed in terms of providing that holistic support um, that, that we know folks need in order to get up and out of homelessness. Yeah, if you'd like to come on up, if you guys have questions. to uh, 
there that could lead to breaking the law, that could lead to an arrest, that could lead to now having a record and not being able to get out of that state. So I don't think arresting our way out of it is the answer. But I also think if our resources are all used and people are bailing out because we don't have places for inmates, then that sounds like a resource problem. We don't have rehab beds. That sounds like a resource <coughs> money problem. Um, so I guess I just was wondering, I didn't want to be all negative either. So I did have a few ideas about, uh, for suggestions. So I did have one question about the uh, minimum wage. So $7.25 an hour with an average cost of $900 for a one bedroom apartment is really the numbers don't work for people. So what about minimum wage? And that's a state, not a city issue. Um, so minimum wage and then, sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> part of the conversation that was captured in the housing and sector capacity subcommittee, um, which it's a great point and one that I think needs further exploration and um, work on because uh, I, the conversation or nature of the report from that subcommittee was, you know, there's clearly a need here and we need to figure out a way to align the resources to incentivize creating that capacity. Um, on the business uh, taxes piece. Um, as the Chamber of Commerce, we're trying to attract businesses here every day of the week. It's what we do. We, we do have a business profits tax and business enterprise tax in New Hampshire, but we have a tax climate that overall rates very, very favorably. But I think your point is, is, is really well taken that um, the more investment we can get in our community, the more resources it's going to create to allow us to address these issues. and. Um, one way we can all play a role in that is is talking about the favorable business climate and, and uh, quality of life and things that we have here, amenities that we have here that make New Hampshire a great place to uh, live and work. Um, and then I don't know if anyone on the panel wants to just talk about, I think the point about resources is something that you've all touched on. The one thing I would just add is, is that a lot of what you alluded to does flow upstream to policy decisions that are happening at the state level or even federal level. And as a, someone who works for a chamber of commerce that advocates for policy changes, um, one thing I would encourage every person to do that if you have a, a feeling about an issue like minimum wage or a feeling about a policy issue related to funding for homelessness services or, or substance use issues, um, call your state senator, call your state representative and tell them what you think. I can say without question that in all my years of doing that work, that if a representative or senator gets five phone calls on one issue, it's a mandate from the people. Um, so I really encourage you to be part of that process, participate in that process. It may not seem like it's that important or it's having an impact, but when they hear about it, it does create uh, a difference and does create change. So I encourage you to be part of that process. So do you guys, Anna, do you want to touch on the resource piece? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, I think first and foremost, I just want to thank the people who have come forward um, and are and been so courageous in sharing their stories. And to me, that is really what this is about, is, is that perseverance to keep forging ahead and bettering yourself, no matter what circumstance you're in. And I just really want to commend them for um, taking that risk and, and being that vulnerable in front of us. So thank you for that. Um, I will tell you, and I, I'm going to call out, there's the public health director in the room from the city of Nashua, Bobby Bagley, is also here, um, and thank you for being here, Bobby. Bobby and I um, and our health departments are both part of an initiative through the Kresge Foundation, um, the Emerging Leaders of Public Health Initiative. 
And um, why that is important is Kresge Foundation is actually known for its work in revitalizing cities. So we have, as, as the two largest cities in the state of New Hampshire, reached out to the Kresge Foundation to help us look at our cities and transform our work in public health. So as part of that work, we're actually having Kresge come out at the end of the month to visit with all of our community investors. And, and what I mean by that are people who have resources to devote to big problems facing the community. So our charitable trust, because they have to do some community benefits um, for various you know, issues in communities. Our uh, philanthropy, you know, our organizations who are funders, our banks who have foundations and give money, and private businesses who give money. So we're really trying to get everyone in the room together to learn about how other cities have done this well. And one of the things that Kresge will talk about is you know, we all can just do a little, and that can bring us a lot further. So one of the models they talk about is setting up a funding hub, and everybody gives a little bit to that funding hub, and then you can fund larger scale initiatives. So in this instance, as a community, we have to have a consensus about well, what, what's that big issue that we all want to work on, and if this is it, then as a funding hub, then we start devoting resources through that mechanism. And this is what we sit on for years. It's not something that fixes itself in one year. This is a multi-year dedicated effort at a much larger scale. And this has been done in other parts of the country. And cities like Nashua and Manchester, we are part of the 500 largest cities in the country. And we're seeing this happen all over the place. So we know it can be done. Um, so we can't necessarily turn to solutions in the state of New Hampshire because we don't have a lot of communities that look like us. We are an urban center, we are a larger city, and the kinds of issues that we're seeing in Manchester, whether it's crime, whether it's homelessness, whether it's you know, individuals struggling with addiction, are not uncommon to large cities, and it's not uncommon to a lot of parts of the country. So we just need to learn from other communities outside of our state walls to see what else can be done and what can be done innovatively to bring those resources here in a new way. We need new financing models, new business models, that are gonna withstand the test of time. You know, we're all gonna come and go, but we need systems that are gonna hang on to be able to be there for people throughout their lifespan, not just for the now and, and fixing it now. We have about 10 or 15 minutes uh, to go, um, but if, so if you have any more questions, please come on forward. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't know if the mayor 
you want to jump in. I mean, all of this is very um, public. At any time, you know, we try to put any of the budget items very publicly out facing on our web pages. You are welcome as taxpayers of the city to visit any city department. We are happy to share with you um, where all of that money goes and how those decisions are made. I mean, that is, we're public servants, so we want to do our due diligence to make sure that we're responsible with what taxpayers are providing for us. So I know the mayor has been very good about really trying to be very transparent about all of that and inclusive of that. Um, and I don't know, I don't want to put you in the spot that you were going to. Yeah, with, I was just speaking with the mayor. It, it is a, it's an important question. It's a, a complex one that we probably can't dive fully into right now. But um, a good deal of that information is available on the city website. The um, uh, task force report touched on that and there was also a uh, study uh, conducted by some fellows from Harvard that came up and participated in the task force that put together a report specifically on that issue of where is all the funding going and how is it dispersed across all the different agencies and it provided it in a way that I thought it was actually pretty digestible for a pretty complex uh, topic so we'll work on getting that available uh, to the public I'm not sure if it's posted publicly right now but we'll look into that. Um, but then finally, I would just uh, also add from, again, from the business community perspective, um, Manchester is an economic leader. And as part of that uh, role of being an economic leader, it creates prosperity that ripples outward to all of our surrounding communities, all of Southern New Hampshire and our state as a whole. So I, I do think it's an important conversation to have and one that we need to have with our state legislature, with our policymakers, that if we're, if Manchester as an economic driver is creating value for the rest of our state. It's important that we advocate to bring resources back to the community to address issues we have so that we can sustain uh, that value as an economic leader. And so again, that's an important conversation to have with policymakers. So just one important thing, I think when you look at the city budget, the majority of money that's going toward affecting and uh, helping with these issues comes from uh, CIP, community improvement, so federal funds focused uh, specifically home funds and CDBG. That's the majority, you know, the two to three to, you know, three to five million dollars that the city can allocate to go toward things like the new horizons and the transition, Waypoint, um, Harbor Homes, and okay, Way Home, and uh, nonprofits such as that. And so, but everything is online. Uh, right now, what you'll see online is the budget that I prepared. Uh, which now the Alderman have and will be working on, so the final budget is not addressed. So if you do have any comments or suggestions about that allocation, there's still an opportunity to provide comments. Great, thank you for the question. We have time for a few more questions. Yes, please come on up. So I'm Thomas Carter, uh, representing Good Samaritan Network. I just wanted to respond to the comment earlier about the, uh, the faith community. Uh, we really appreciated the mayor's office uh, reaching out to us and having us uh, work with them and, and Waypoint and this transition um, about that event. Uh, I think it was a great step forward. Um, we, we have a challenge ourselves in getting all of the, the churches uh, to work together across denominational lines. Um, we've, uh, we've had some, uh, some, some great success in doing some trainings within the churches to get, um, to get uh, folks to understand uh, what's going on even within their, in, you know, their congregation, the, the folks sitting in their congregations are dealing with these issues, and, and actually uh, creating small teams within churches to, uh, to know how to respond and to plug them into the right resources uh, that are available to them. So, um, so we're doing a lot on that side. We're also trying to platform all of the services that are available. There's amazing organizations across the state um, that are, uh, you know, individual churches doing their individual things, um, and we don't know where there's gaps and where there's a lot of overlap, and so we're trying to, uh, to database that and, and get those to work together. So there's a lot of work to do, but um, we really appreciate the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, move forward with that. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. for sharing that. Yes, sir. Please come up forward. I showed up a little bit late. My name is Richard Bernier, and um, this is awesome stuff. It really is. Chief Capano, thank you for your service. Um, like I said, my name is Richard Bernier. I've had a lot to do in my lifetime in this town with doing the wrong thing, to give people a place to go to do their drugs, to 
We run a trap house. I was probably the most watched house in Manchester for years. Now, I'm part of this. So over a couple of years, work with the homeless. And I'm gonna tell you what worked for me. You talked about that, that window of opportunity is what got sparked me to find a better way of life. I had nowhere else to turn. That's what worked for me, and I'm stuck. I stay out there, people would hand me food. I'm not gonna wanna get help, people give me a couple bucks. That doesn't work. I see it happening every day. I live in the thick of it again. Went to California, I go on and on, but I got some help because I really wanted the help. I really couldn't live that way anymore. I was dying. I had a syringe in one pocket, a crack pipe in the other, and I was the kind of guy that would steal your wallet and help you look for it. Now I'm not the people here. This is awesome. Now I, I, I care so much. I love people. I found a new way of life. But I was in that rut where I see a lot of the homeless and I see them every day. I love them. I'm no better than them. I'm just sober today. I live at the Robinson house. I came back to town here and I saw a lot of good stuff happening. I was homeless behind couple, Cumberland Farms a couple of years ago looking for a frozen donut. And I had nowhere else to turn to. It got me to find help finally. <coughs> through the police, who it was, I was forced into this for years, but this time I did it because I, I just couldn't live this way no more. And I see a lot of the homeless that are stuck in the same rut, but families in transition. I'm hearing a lot of good things. Encouragement, we can encourage our way out of this. Not just, not put people in jail. That, we know that doesn't work, but through mental health, programs, identities that are in Manchester. I'm currently at the Robinson House. There's a couple of guys, the director from Help and Hansi and Larry Nice and Guy, they gave me a place to go when I came back to town because I would have been homeless again. Um, but I think what these little meetings, these things that are going on in town, the better police present on, presence on Elm Street, walk in the beat, and everybody working together, churches are coming together, I'm seeing it get a little better. I mean, the encouragement, and, and I'm one of the successful guys that maybe you guys need to hear. We hear a lot of, of the overdose and the deaths in this place, and, but there are people making it because they really, they just simply kind of want to, you know? They, they're off, they're hanging around in the park, and they're with their yo-yos and their friends, and I was one of them, I was one of them, so I know, but you know what, like I said, I'm just no better than them, but they just don't know nothing else they need like us to go around the parks, to walk around and say, hey, look at me, you can do this too, and offer them opportunities. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for, for sharing your experience. Um, so we're getting close to having, uh, to, to wrapping up, um, to, um, I want to pose a question to our panel just to, to wrap up before with a few closing uh, announcements, but we've heard a lot tonight and you know this is the beginning of a conversation and the first of, of several, but um, if you could leave everyone with just a couple of words briefly of if you were to encourage folks to take something away from tonight on how they can contribute to um, being part of a solution to taking action themselves, uh, what would that be? Wow, that's tough. That's a big question. So I'll try to be um, quick about it. I just think at the end of the day, uh, you know, and I think Mary Slime is one of the best spokespeople for this, um, we have to remind ourselves that all life is precious. And you may not always like what people do, um, but there's, there's something to be said about that life and our responsibility in serving it. Um, I think, you know, I, I get dismayed when I hear frustration in the community and people are referring, you know, to others, and they kind of um, criminalize, you know, homeless individuals. And I think if we start from that place of anger and hate, um, it doesn't really get us far. I think we just get more frustrated. So I guess if I had a wish or you know something that I hope you all walk away with is I think we have to start with the tone that a caring community would not let its people end up on the streets, right? And that it starts with all of us in our own moral compass and how we feel about human life. 
Um, and that's tough. We have to start there and embrace that before we can move forward to actually find solutions. And just like this fantastic gentleman who just spoke was talking about believing in people and seeing that this can happen, we have to believe in the city as well. And I think we are demonstrating that every single day that we are trying to work together and cross-pollinate as much as we can and you know, it's all hands on deck. So I encourage you to be involved in whatever way you see yourself in this campaign, even if it's just starting with you and your own moral compass. Um, and then encouraging and sending that message out throughout the whole community because we have to set the tone. We control the tone. Yeah, and so I think Anna sort of talks about the moral argument for why we need to end homelessness in, 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 in the United States. Um, but I also think it's important that we remember that there's also an economic argument to this um, because the truth really is that homelessness really comes at a very high, high cost. And it is a problem that is too expensive not to fix. Uh, because what research is showing is that you know it's much more cost effective to provide people with housing than it is to leave them on the streets where they're using very high cost public services like police and fire contact and um, you know medical care, ER visits. Um, all of that comes at a very high cost, and so we know that it's much. Um, cheaper for the community to actually provide folks with housing. So not only is it the morally right thing to do, but it also makes economic sense. And because youth are my passion and where I work, um, I am going to say don't forget about the young people because although 60% of our young people are currently couch surfing, if we don't do something to help them, the couches are going to run out and they are going to be the future population of our street homeless individuals in our community. And so thinking about prevention all along the way, I do the work that I do because I'm trying to prevent these young people from becoming chronically homeless and intervene in a time in their life where it could change the trajectory of their lives. And so really thinking about the young people in our community that are invisible and are not necessarily on the street panhandling, but maybe sleeping from couch to couch to couch every night, and recognizing that not every young person in our community that's walking down the street carrying a backpack is on the way to school. Um, I want to say that I've never been more hopeful that we can address the issue of street homelessness and put an end to it. And I do feel like there are opportunities for resources and organizations like Families in Transition and Horizons need to take advantage of these um, resources while they're available. And we need to act very quickly and come up with the ability to get buildings, set them aside, so that each year when these rounds come through, we can actually apply for this funding. Um, and, um, and I've never seen the community come together in 28 years, come together like it has. Um, and I just feel like, you know, I'm not trying to just pump sunshine. Um, I really believe that we can do this um, without a doubt. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause for our panel for, for time. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all again for uh, taking some time to participate in this important conversation. Just a couple of reminders, if you didn't sign in on your way in, please do so on your way out so we can continue to communicate with you and share information and updates. Um, I think the overriding message you just heard was um, find your own path to be part of the solution. There's lots of different ways to help in different ways and I encourage you to do that. And I know all of these uh, folks here and the others you heard from, uh, reach out to them. Uh, talk, talk to their organizations, find a way to engage and I'm sure they will uh, find a way to make use of, of your willingness to help. Um, and uh, with that, thanks so much for coming out. Have a uh, great night, everyone. Thank you.